Hi, my name is Allison, and I'm the founder of Honey Badger Radio. I hope you enjoy this content. Feminism is a product. It's a very successful product. Among its benefits and features, the ability to galvanize your political base, to dehumanize your political opponents, sell vast quantities of useless goods to the female consumer, promote big charity, create command narratives that maintain effective social control, and create a moral axis around which you can revolve a society. The myth that we live in a patriarchy, a society that oppresses women in order to unfairly benefit men, brings people together. It's a great sales pitch. It's a great enemy to fight. It gives everyone a purpose. Women a justification for their right to judge men morally and men an identity of social dominance, even if it's just as the baddie. Fundamentally, feminism is more than just the word. It's the desire for the benefits feminism brings not just into the political sphere in the form of mudslinging heavy weaponry, but also the personal. I've lost count of how many times I've heard a woman win an argument with a man by invoking the dread specter of patriarchy. We live in a patriarchy, therefore you have to do what I say, concede my points, and accept what I'm asserting, or you're oppressing me as a man. It's a dynamic that's as old as time, women both recognize men's identity of greater strength and in the same breath demand they use it for the benefit of women. Feminism is simply an extension of that. So feminism is a product with a lot of uses. And products don't have to make sense. They just have to be useful. Men's issues, the men's issues we bring up, are factually sound. In a world of logic and sense, they should matter because the word equality should mean something other than yet another way we can frame women as victims. It makes no sense to unquestioningly view women as victims of inequality without looking at the other side. <clears throat> this pen is unequal. Unequal to what? I'm saying it's unequal. Are you anti-pen? Does, doesn't matter what it's unequal to. What matters is it's a victim of inequality. And as an advocate for pen equality, give me money and do what I say. That's feminism. We can't ask, well, what, what is this equal to? How can you even make the equal? Where's the equation? How do you make the equivalence? Have you measured whatever you're saying pens aren't equal to? No, they've done none of that but we just accept it because it's a good product and it works. Saying women are victims of inequality is really where the impulse, the technique, it's where a feminist product breaks down into incoherence because no one measures the other side. In fact, they have a whole suite of ways of blaming you or shaming you for trying to measure the other side. So despite the fact that they're declaring some sort of equality, they've never measured both sides, which is by definition is absolute absurdity, but it's a great product. And the only ones who measure the other side are us men's issues advocates. And we're completely isolated from institutional power. And I'm going to be honest here. There's a reason why, and it's obvious. Feminism is a good thing that our society has going. It works. It does what it's supposed to. We've had big lies before that we just used to keep things turning over. We've had big lies that also required sacrifices before, mostly of men. So what's the difference, really? I mean, if you think about it, there is none. Now let's look at men's rights. Let's take all of the self-righteous activizing out of it. Let's look at it from a purely marketing perspective. From a marketing perspective, men's rights is total shit. It literally is what's left over when you make equality into a useful product. Again, that useful product being feminism. In recognizing men's issues, you make feminism not useful anymore. And a lot of livelihoods and companies and institutions revolve around feminism as a product, either developing it, constructing it, deploying it, using it, selling it. You thought oil was critical to our economy. It's got nothing on feminism. That's pretty depressing, isn't it? It is depressing, but it's a reality we have to face. The incumbent, the established product, is big. It's entrenched, it's ubiquitous. It's Coke and Microsoft and Google and Disney and big oil all rolled into one. And what are we? Do we even have anything functional to offer society? What happens if tomorrow our wish comes true 
And everyone recognizes that men's have issues on par with women's issues, perhaps even more severe. Okay, we did it, men's rights activists. We recognize what you're saying. Now what? Do we lay off all the factory line workers creating feminism? We no longer have a grand narrative uniting everyone against the economy. How do we motivate people? How do we get them to cooperate? The charity industries disappeared. Now no one can sell Nikes, women's Nikes and pink razors anymore because we can't strip women of agency in order to sell it back to them in the form of a crappy product. The consumer dollar is collapsing. Now everything is still going to shit, but faster. Does anyone else think about these things or am I the only one? So what do we do? What do we do? In order to compete with an established industry leader, you have to do something better, faster, or cheaper. Well, we're not going to do it better or faster than feminism. That It's too good at what it does. As for cheaper, nope. You just have to open your mouth and say, women need, and people are thrusting money at you before you can even finish your sentence. Cheaper, faster, better. Or you can do something different. The different things don't have established markets. Eris was the Greek goddess of strife. A while back, I talked about how there are two basic, two basic feminine archetypes, the catabolitic and the anabolitic. The catabolitic encourages violent conflict between men by playing the victim. The anabolitic brings men together in cooperation based on a shared identity rooted in virtue. Eris is the ultimate expression of the catabolic feminine, the feminine that tears people apart. Eris, whose wrath is relentless. She is the sister and companion of murderous Ares. She, who is only a little thing at first, but thereafter grows, till she strides on earth with her head striking heaven. She then hurled down bitterness equally between both sides as she walked through the onslaught, making men's pain heavier. That's from Homer's Iliad. Eris was the goddess that started the Trojan War by throwing the apple of discord in between Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera. That's sort of her thing, you see, creating nasty conflicts and making conflicts nastier. To bring it into the human scale, imagine if you have two men competing in a friendly contest. Eris would come around and say, the outcome of this contest will determine my affections. And then the men are in a fight instead of a friendly rivalry. Or she could say, the outcome of this fight will determine my honor. Now we have a duel to the death. Or Eris could say, the outcome of this duel will determine my well-being and the well-being of all women. And now we have a war. Eris amplifies conflict by giving it bigger and bigger stakes. And the biggest stakes of all is the well-being of women. No society survives unless it takes care of its women. There is no identity without women at the center because of that. And that's just as true for conflict. Eris knows this and uses it. Eris sounds very familiar, doesn't she? Feminism is very much like Eris. Feminism applies bigger and bigger consequences to conflict by manufacturing bigger and bigger stakes, bigger and bigger female victimhoods. Bigger ways that women's well-being is in jeopardy. One example, American politics has always been contentious, but have you noticed that they've gotten worse since Eris had this galaxy brain moment? The outcome of the political fight between the left and the right in the United States determines the well-being of American women. This rhetoric inexorably leads to civil war, but is Eris the only thing there is to strife? Hesiod in Works and Days writes, it was never true that there was only one kind of strife, Eris. There have always been two on earth. There is one you could like when you understand her. The other is hateful. The two strifes have separate natures. There is one strife who builds up evil war and slaughter. She is harsh, no man loves her. But the other one was born the elder daughter of Black Knight. She is far kinder. She pushes the shiftless man to work for all his laziness. A man looks to his neighbor who is rich, then he too wants to work. Such strife is a good friend to mortals. Then Potter is Potter's enemy, and Craftsman is Craftsman's rival. 
Tramp is jealous of Tramp and singer of singer. Hesiod never gives a name to his second strife. I'd like to propose one. I'd like to call her Agones. The root agon comes from the Greek word agon, which is translated with a number of meanings, among them contest, competition at games, and gathering. In ancient Greece, agones, also known as agones, were contests held during public festivals. One example is the Olympics. If Eris raises the stakes to send men to war, agones changes the stakes entirely. If Eris is catabolic, feminine, the feminine that set men at each other's throats, Agones brings them together in a shared endeavor, either cooperative or competitive. But how do you turn Eris into Agones? When the Sabine women rush the battlefield to stop their husbands, the Romans, and their fathers and brothers, the Sabines, slaughtering each other over the Sabine women's honor, the women said, if we are the source of the conflict, then kill us instead of each other. The Sabine women forced their men on both sides to choose between the conflict and what the conflict was over. If they continued to fight, there would be no women left to fight for. So that's almost the opposite of what Eris does. Eris goes in and says, you know, the outcome of this fight is our honor. And the Sabine women went in and said, the outcome of this fight will be our death. The Sabine women changed the stakes. In fact, they took the stakes out of the conflict entirely and put them into ending the conflict. Without those stakes, the conflict lost its meaning to the men of both sides, and they stopped killing each other. But even more importantly, the Sabine women loved the men of both sides more than they loved their honor, more than they loved the ability to apply stakes to a conflict. The force that turns Eris into Agones is love. The potter's love of his craft makes him want to earn the respect of other men who share his craft. The musician's love of music does likewise, and a Roman man's love of Rome, Roma, makes him want to earn the respect of other Roman men by serving her. Tribal competition didn't stop in Rome, but now Roman men competed to increase the prestige of their tribe by becoming the first man in Rome, respected by all other men because he lifted Rome and he lifted all other men up through his success. Like the Roman identity before it, the American identity inspired its sons to cooperative greatness, self-sacrifice to protect the world. While ethnicities were still killing each other in Europe, they became neighbors in America. America inspired diverse people to come together around a common dream of prosperity and freedom. America ended some of the greatest ills plaguing humanity since the dawn of time, ended them, slavery and segregation and ethnic tribalism. It's coming back now, but America did all of that under the watchful eye of Agones, embodied by Columbia and Lady Liberty, two anabolic feminine archetypes that emphasize men's unity by embodying the virtue of their identity rather than their enmity through victimhood. Men possessed by Eris want to subjugate other men. Men inspired by Agones want to earn the respect of other men who share their identity. Before the modern era, we could afford to have Eris lead us down the primrose path to total annihilation. Because for most of human history, total annihilation meant two tribes killing each other utterly and nothing more. Now it means ending our species and all life on Earth. Eris is more than just a tragedy. She is the most dangerous psychological force on the planet. Her end goal is to launch every nuke, every single nuke, Every single nuke on Earth. Everyone forgot about that, didn't they? I've always thought that global warming alarmists were very optimistic. Do they really think we're going to get to the point, get, we're going to exist long enough to have a problem with global warming? When, we're, when, when the most powerful and armed nations on the planet are in a love affair with Eris? And, and I don't just mean between each other, I mean within each other, within. War and conflict are profitable, both materially and in terms of maintaining power over your population. After all, there was a reason why in Orwell's 1984, the autocratic dystopia Oceana was always at war with either Eurasia or East Asia. In this case, feminism says that society itself is waging a war on its women. 
Thus, feminism has created a society at war with itself, which is frankly the most unique way to worship Eris in human history. So props for that, you know, like, wow, we have, <laughs> when we go out, it will be with a bang. However, saying society is at war with its own women is not a narrative that can be sustained long term. It can't sustain a society, a collective cooperative identity for very long. It's about the exact opposite of sustainable, relatively speaking. So we have this cooperative American identity, the greatest cooperative identity on the planet, bar none, invested with self-destruction in a time when there has never, we've never been more reliant on our ability to cooperate within our nations and internationally. Global trade, we all rely on it. We all rely on a global economic system that rests on American stability, which itself rests on that aforementioned cooperative American identity. When Uncle Sam chose to dance with feminism, with heiress instead of Egones, with feminism rather than Lady Liberty, it's a very bad sign because where America goes, the greatest cooperative identity on the planet, where America goes, the rest of the world follows. This situation is precarious to say the least. Right now, I think the only thing sustaining it is the fact that nobody can really leave it we are all, we've all lost our ability to walk off into the hills and start up our own self-sustaining agricultural communities. There, but there are a lot of challenges that we're about to face, so we can't just sit on that. The biggest of which is the switchover from the boomers to the millennials, from a generation that has a sense of shared values, family values, from a shared mass media to a generation whose socialization is primarily internet-based, and the internet excels at fracturing us into tribal communities. When you fly Eris's banner, she rewards you with likes and views, subs and revenue. Everyone wants a good bite. Everyone wants to be right. Eris makes both sides believe they're right, and that the only solution is to eradicate the other, either ideologically or physically. I started this by saying feminism is a product. A very successful one. And feminism, strife, heiress, is a great product to sustain corporate greed, government tyranny, academic hegemony, and big media monopoly. So how can our little community create anything that com can compete with that? The answer is we don't. Eris sows the seeds of her own destruction. Either she kills us all, that's killing herself, or she brings us so much pain that people will embrace anything to make it stop. It's pain that makes new markets, and no one brings pain like Eris. In Theogony, and she, destructive knight, born nemesis, who gives much pain to mortals, and afterward cheating deception and loving affection, and then malignant old age and overbearing Eris, discord. Hateful discord, hateful heiress, in turn bore painful hardship and forgetfulness and starvation and the pains full of weeping and the battles and the quarrels and the murders and the manslaughters, the grievances, the lying stories, the disputations and lawlessness and ruin who share one another's nature and oath, who does more damage than any other to earthly men when anyone of his knowledge swears to a false oath. Eris is responsible for false accusations, lying stories, grievances, and lawlessness. If Hesiod wrote today, I think he could recognize a lot of Eris's offspring in our news headlines. Eris inspires nothing but conflict with everyone and anyone, and most importantly, with yourself. If you're in this community, you can already see the pain that everyone else outside of it is in. It can be hard sometimes because we're also in pain, but... We are not in the relationship with that bitch. The nagging ache of anxiety, the slow burning grind of depression, not being able to find a single place to rest from the queasy paranoia or a single person as a confidant. No friends, no home, no countrymen, no refuge and no sanctuary. As they screech about safe spaces, they turn their own spaces into seething pits of abuse. Eris will bring the pain and pain creates markets for new ideas. 
and ours is a very, very new idea. <laughs> How about we show some compassion for men? It's an idea. We express our conflicts through men. Men sacrifice more than anyone else, and we expect them to. They sacrifice more in conflict, they sacrifice more in competition, and they sacrifice more in cooperation. The evidence of that is all around us. Feminism, by blaming men for the suffering of women, makes us all indifferent to men's suffering. When we are indifferent to men's suffering, our conflicts become heiresses' playground, murder, war, genocide. And when we love men, we care about their well-being, our conflicts become agonins, contests, exploration, scientific breakthrough, art, and industry. See mine? I don't know if you've ever seen, have you ever noticed that? Let me see if I can show it. Make art, not war. We will only have a future if we stop Eris, and we can only stop Eris with love. And ours is the community that's really bringing the love. Everyone who stays in it stays in it because they have compassion for men. It's almost impossible to hate women <laughs> to the point where even an accusation can create a billion dollar industry. It's almost impossible to hate women. So when you love men, you are only adding love. You're not subtracting it. And that's our selling point. That's our product. If you look at the course of human history, civilization breaks down into strife over and over again. Eris strides across the face of the world, her crown cracking the sky while graveyards sprout in her footsteps. And then we come together again around the story of love and rediscover Agonis, the Sabine women sacrificing their lives to save their men. Christ sacrificing his life to redeem a corrupt society. Eris breaks us apart, and then we come together again with love. Eris is seductive. She's intoxicating. It's great to drive your enemies before you and hear the lamentation of their women. But I think the average person will eventually realize they'd rather have a hug. Vexum was one of our listeners who attended the Amsterdam meetup. He said this to me in a comment. Before I meet you again, there's something I must say that maybe is a little odd. But you being you, I suppose I don't have to worry about this being taken the wrong way. Last time we met, you hugged me before I left, and I could somehow tell that you really cared about me when you did that, which felt so odd, because, you know, that's not common. So thank you. What else is there to do in this world? but care about each other. And that's what I plan to do. We're gonna care about each other. We're gonna to listen to each other. We're gonna forgive each other. We're going to support each other. And we're gonna do it better, faster, and cheaper than the feminists. Well, we're gonna actually do it. <laughs> I don't think they do that. We're gonna do it better, faster, and cheaper than anyone else in the world. In fact, I think we're the only ones doing it. Let the world play with Eris till they get sick of her shit. We'll be here chilling with Agones. All right, I want to remind everyone that the fundraiser for our European Badger meetups is still on. I want to be able to continue this work, building more connections with more people who care about men around the world. It took me a long time to realize how much missing the ICMI hurt me. About a month and a half before it took about a month and a half before it really hit me, and then it hit me really hard. I uh, ended up crying for a couple weeks. Well, a week. I didn't get to see anyone. I was most excited about getting to see my friends and getting to meet more people. So I want to ask you, all of you listening, to help me make up for that. And, and again, I know this is... This is a selfish request, but I really do want to be able to meet, meet you guys. 
Meeting you all is the best part of doing this work. You all intrigue me, all of you, all of you who care about men. It's so intriguing. So if you'd like to help out, please go to feedthebadger.com. If you want to help signal boost my message on an ongoing basis, you can also get a subscription there as well. There's nothing more important than loving each other. So let's do it. Thank you for your kind attention. Everybody, Natty has asked me to tell you all that I will be speaking at Messages for Men this November 17th in London. And I just wanted to give you an update. We have managed to fund every leg of the journey except for the one to Oslo for the Men's Issues Conference there, November 19th. So if you want to make sure that we can get there, please go to feedthebadger.com. Five bucks, ten bucks, every little bit helps. And thank you for helping us get this far.